This is Cecil Walker, and today is September the 9th, 1986. I was born in Eureka Springs in 1917, and so I'm 69 years old, going on 70, as we say here in Ozark Country. I have lived here all my life, with the exception of two school years in Little Rock, the third and fourth grade, where we lived while my sister Marie was beginning her education at the Arkansas School for the Blind, and I was out of town over three years while serving in the Army Air Force during World War II. My first recollection of being alive was riding down Spring Street in one of the summer streetcars and falling to my hands and knees as I was getting off at the Basin Park and my mother picking the gravels out of the palm of my hands. I believe the car stopped running in 1923 when I was six, but I am not certain as to what year that event took place. My father owned three houses over on East Mountain, and by the time I was in the second grade, we had lived in all three of them. Two of them had been acquired by paying up the back taxes, but I'm not sure about the third one. The one where I was born at 37 Council was known in family circles as the Big House. Another at 23 Council Street was always referred to as down at the other house. And from the time I was in the second grade for many, many years, we lived in the one referred to as the home place. It was a two-story house with a basement on Copper Street and the upstairs, the main part of the house, on Council Street. We used the Copper Street address, 43 Copper. It was closer to the street for the mailbox. However, packages were delivered on Council Street as they were delivered by the rural carrier whose route was up council and on out to the highway. The original part of the house was built by an uncle by the name of John Holland. It was later abandoned by another owner by the name of Degosha. When my father acquired the house by paying up the taxes, it had deteriorated considerably and was being used by Mr. Bickford to store his hay and sacks of feed for his horses. He lived around past the Soldier Spring, but evidently had no place to store his hay. After roofing the house and replastering the walls and ceilings of the original part, and having a carpenter by the name of Boss Coons add on two rooms, a wraparound porch on the Copper Street side, and a small porch on the Council Street side, it became a comfortable home. When the water line reached East Mountain, the north side of the wraparound porch was closed in to make a bathroom, and about the same time, residential electricity became available. The initial wiring, consisting of a two-piece porcelain rosette with a three-foot drop cord and a key socket installed in the center of the ceiling in each room. This was quite an improvement over the kerosene lamps, which were then stored away somewhere, usually on a high shelf where they would be handy in case the new system didn't always work. The new bathroom was cold as the underneath part of the porch was open and it was on the north side. So the following summer, Aunt Rhoda, that was my father's sister, and her husband, Uncle Henry, came for a month's visit. Relatives used to come and stay for a month or sometimes they stayed all summer. Being a carpenter of sorts, Uncle Henry closed in the underneath part of the bathroom, making a storeroom where a water heater was installed, and we no longer had to heat the bath water on the stove. And we added hot water faucets to the sinks and so forth. The plumbing was done by Jim Lent. Uh, Jim still lives here in Eureka Springs. From that time on, for the next 40 years or more, until the house left the family in the late 70s, that storeroom was called Henry. A winter supply of potatoes was always stored down in Henry. The onions were hung from the ceiling down in Henry. All of the fruit jars were stored down in Henry. Our immediate family was my father and mother, my sister Marie, who was blind, and myself. At one time, my father had a shop I believe at 42 Spring Street, a few doors above the Basin Park Hotel, where he sold handmade onyx jewelry, paperweights and curios, Eureka Spring souvenirs made to specification in Germany, and hand-painted dishes made in Bavaria. He and S.B. Jordan were partners in having postcards with Eureka Spring scenes printed in Germany. Some of his cards were selected for the centennial postcard history of Eureka Springs. 
I was the last of eight children, and but toward the time that I could remember, he had closed the store about 19 and 20 and set up his own onyx shop at home. And he supplied several other shops with his handmade onyx items for years. When I was growing up, Eureka Springs was not known as a retirement community, and lots of kids lived over on East Mountain. Just offhand, I can think of 18 families, some of them with as many as four children. The streets were not blacktopped, and during dry periods of summer, the street sprinkler would come by several times a day with water spraying from a huge tank on the back. The kids always watched for it, so we could run along the side with the cool water spraying on our feet and legs. Another summer pastime was waiting for the ice truck to come. Nearly everyone bought ice to put in their ice boxes, and the ice company furnished cards reading 15 pounds, 25 pounds, 50 pounds, and so forth to be hung in a window where the delivery man could see how much to deliver. The ice was in huge 100-pound pieces or maybe larger, and after he chipped off the required amount, he would let us reach in and get some of the chips. Every kid in the neighborhood had an old tire to roll, and we would roll them from the point of East Mountain out to the highway and back. If we saw a snake in the road, we would see who could roll our tire over it first. We also rolled tires on what was called the Lower Street, from our house out to the Willis House, which is now the home of Ruth Icor. Actually, it's at least four streets by name, but it was just a little road to us. And at the end, we would always get a nice cold drink of water at the Stites Spring. If we could find a tire from a car that had been used in a city with paved streets, it would be flat enough to stand alone when we parked it instead of having to lean it against something. When not rolling tires, we would roll hoops. A hoop was a metal band about 12 inches in diameter that probably came from an old wooden keg. After finding a hoop, we would take a lath about 4 feet long and nail a 12-inch cross piece on one end of it. To get the hoop started, it was rolled at an angle down the lath and then be pushed along by the cross piece. We would start at the top of the mountain and see who could roll the hoop the farthest before it fell over or got away. I was never able to get my hoop all the way out to the highway, although occasionally someone did. One time a tire got away in the vicinity of East Mountain Point above the Soldier Spring and rolled all the way down the hill to Main Street before it lodged in the ditch opposite the Gad Spring. Three of us were following close behind trying to catch it before it hit a cow or a horse on the way down or maybe a car down on Main Street. I doubt whether a runaway tire could get as far as 10 feet now with all of the undergrowth, vines, and brush that now covers the hills. The point of East Mountain was grassy and looked like a well-kept lawn. It was a popular spot for taking photographs of persons with a view of the city in the background. One Easter, the sunrise service was held there on the point. Children from the various Sunday school classes formed a cross, the boys wearing white shirts and the girls white dresses with a choir in the background. It was on a slope and a large crowd gathered at Harding Spring to view the scene and hear the choir. The annual Easter egg hunt was often held on East Mountain Point. It was just like a park up there. Another game we played was called shinny. A shinny stick was made from a shrub with a curb or a knot on the bottom where the root started to resemble a golf club. We would dig a small hole in the ground at each end of the playing spot and the players on each side would try to knock a cream can into the hole on the opposite side. After the can had been batted around a while, it became almost round. Any player was lucky if he ended up without a blue spot on one or both of his shins. After a strenuous game, we would get in a porch swing to cool off and get it going as high as we could without our heads hitting the ceiling. On Saturday evenings, most of the kids would go to the Commodore Theater across from the Baptist Church. The film was usually a western with Tom Mix, Buck Jones, Hoot Gibson, Ken Mannard, and many of the other western heroes. The feature was always preceded with a serial which would run for several months. Three that I remember were Tarzan of the Apes, Trooper 77 about the Northwest Mounted Police, and The Blake of Scotland Yard, a whodunit set in England. These movies were silent as talkies had not yet reached Eureka Springs, but the theater had a player piano down in front with the keyboard and rolled 
section in the center providing background music. And on each side, there was a music box the size of a full piano, which produced sounds of whistles, drums, bells, horses running to the tune of calliope music, train whistles, and other sounds to accent a silent movie. The player piano and the music boxes were operated by Kate Evans, who never missed a cue. When she would come down the aisle to start the music, everyone would shout and clap their hands as we knew the show was about to start. We eventually outgrew the tires, hoops, shinny sticks, and Saturday westerns, and by the time talkies arrived, we were usually going to the show on Fridays, sometimes with a girl if we had enough money to stop by Charlie Springer's confectionery to get some popcorn. Of course, the girl bought her own ticket and usually bought some chewing gum. The Eureka Springs School, now called the Old Red Brick, was located on Prospect Street and consisted of three structures. The first and second grade in the overflow room was in the frame building located on the edge of a rock wall above Howell Avenue. The school ground was terraced and there was a bridge connecting its top story with the upper playground. The third and fourth grade was in the lower level of the red brick, although there was another level below that where the janitor's supply room and restrooms were located. The fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades were on the main floor of the red brick and the high school, including the library, science laboratory, and study hall, was on the top floor. The superintendent's office, commercial department, home economics, and manual training, which I believe is now called industrial arts, was in the frame building with a curved porch on the Singleton Street side of the school grounds. Of course, some of the rooms were changed from time to time, but that's the way they were arranged during my 12 years there. All three of those buildings, I believe, are now private residences. A small shed on the north side of the administration building was converted into a music room where Mrs. Pauline Amos gave piano lessons. Members of the band had their lessons and practice sessions in a large room in the Thatch Hotel, and special programs, eighth grade graduation exercises, and so forth were held in the beautiful Christian church just across Prospect Street. The Thatch Hotel, the Christian Church, and several houses burned, I believe, in 1932. I was in a class on the north side of the school building, and we were allowed to go to the windows for a short while to observe the fire while it was at its height. And when burning shingles began to fall on the school grounds, school was dismissed with instructions to go home and not to tarry in the fire zone. It was an awesome sight to see the Thatch Tower fall into the inferno, and the white columns of the Christian church turned black and burst into flames. The band was not a school band, it was a city band, and the members were of all ages. However, the school officials cooperated by allowing members who were in school to be excused for lessons and practice sessions. The band was named the Ozark Band of Eureka Springs and was organized by Mr. Everett Johnson and was later directed by Miss Sally Mae Shannon, a teacher of music who had a studio on Spring Street. This band was active in the late 20s and early 30s and won first place in its category at the state band contest in Fort Smith, Arkansas. We used the prize money to buy uniforms. The members of the band were asked to meet the train which brought John Philip Sousa's band to Eureka Springs for their concert, I believe in 1929, and help unload their instruments and transport them to the new city auditorium. When the March King himself got off the train and thanked us for helping with the instruments, it was a high point of my year, and we thought he might give us free tickets to the concert, but no such luck. I played first cornet, and the training received from Everett Johnson permitted me to get a band scholarship later at college. Along in the 20s, the streets were paved, and it was interesting to linger on the way home from school to watch the workmen operate the machinery. They had to remove about a six-inch layer of dirt before pouring cement, and forms had to be set for the curbing. On some of the streets, there were stone curbs, but they still put a cement curb up against the stone curb, making it a double curb. One afternoon, I stopped in front of Walker Brothers' store to watch them taking up some of the old streetcar tracks that were still in the ground, when one of the workmen found a hatchet. Floyd Walker, the patriarch of Walker Brothers, was standing there and shouted, That's one of Carrie Nation's hatchets. Some of the grown-ups gathered around to look at the hatchet, and my guess is that it probably ended up in someone's collection or in a museum somewhere. 
Nearly everyone walked to school, and from East Mountain we would go down East Mountain Steps, now called Jacob's Ladder, cross Main Street and go up through the Landecker Hotel property to Center Street, up the steps between the All Red Hotel and the Bloxham Building, up Spring Street to the Post Office, up Sweet Spring Steps, and follow the path around the mountain to Kansas Street and across a long wooden bridge to the school grounds. If we went home for lunch, we took the same route in reverse and back again. Sometimes we went home for lunch, and sometimes we took her lunch and ate at school. Mr. F. O. Butt, an attorney and former state representative and mayor, owned a beautiful southern-style home called Ravenwood on the property where Land and Odd Court is now located. He had four sons who walked to school, which was considerably farther than East Mountain. Evidently, it didn't bother their education. They all became lawyers and doctors. The youngest son, Tom, near my age, is still serving in the position of a, a chancery judge, I believe, at Fayetteville. When we were in the seventh grade, Lonnie Roark, who was in my class, had two newspaper routes. And as the subscribers increased, it became too much for him to get all the papers delivered before school, and so the route was divided up, and I took half of it. We delivered the Springfield Daily News and the Joplin Globe. We would pick up the papers about 5.30 a.m. in the office of the Roark Transportation Company in the All Red Hotel and finish delivery by the time school started at 8.30. During the summer months, we also delivered an evening paper, the Joplin News Herald. We sold lots of extras in the Camp Leith area, as many of the tourists were used to reading an evening paper. We would pick out what we thought was the most important story on the front page and go through the campground shouting, extra, extra, read all about it. The pay was a dollar and a half a week to start and eventually reached two seventy-five a week. When I was in the 10th grade, the janitor at the telephone company decided to give up his job and go to St. Louis where he had some relatives and thought he could do better up there. His first name was Crow, but I never knew his last name. Crow was a fairly young man of colored origin, and he had a wife and two young children. In addition to the work at the telephone company, he also had a shoe shining stand in the Basin Park Barbershop. After he had gone, I was fortunate enough to get the job. The Southwestern Bell Telephone Company central office was located upstairs in the Hawley Building, above where Fleece and Flax, I believe, is now located. I went to work at 5.30 a.m. each morning. There was a stairway, a wide hall, a restroom, and three rooms to be cleaned every day, plus carrying up enough coal from the bin on Center Street to last the operators until school was out. Then I would go by and carry up enough coal for the night shift. A manual switchboard divided into three sections for three operators was located in the front room overlooking Spring Street, along with the chief operator's desk and a huge coal stove. The center room was almost completely filled with wiring and batteries. It was always warm, and there was a constant humming in that room. The back room was the office of plant manager, Mr. Carl Orendorf. There was no stove in that room, but by keeping the door open, some of the heat from the center room would reach the back room. The equipment shed was down on Center Street on the opposite side of the street. On Saturdays, the floors were mopped, the woodwork washed, and once a month, floors waxed and the windows washed. The pay was $18 a month, which was the best job in town for a school student. I regularly received memos and brochures from headquarters in Fort Smith and St. Louis, which made me feel important even though I were just a janitor. The telephone operators were Maystar Miller, Elsie Spangler, Beulah Jackson, Fern Fanning, Ova Talent, and the chief operator was Miss Cherish Pease. In the early 30s, there were several bad fires, two of which I remember vividly in addition to the Thatch Hotel fire. The Southern Hotel was an imposing frame building sitting on the hillside above the Basin Circle. It burned early one morning. The entire sky was red and the flames rose high over the business section. We watched it burn from our yard with sadness for we knew that another landmark that we had viewed from our home for so many years was gone. Another, the Ellis Building, burned at night, and I dressed and went over town to see uh, what was going on, and there was a large crowd gathered in front of the building. Just as I arrived, 
the interior collapsed and fell into the center street level, leaving most of the beautiful stonework in the arches along Spring Street still standing. They were later taken down, and as many of the stones as possible were salvaged, including the sculptured faces, which are now incorporated in the stone wall at sidewalk level where the building stood. During my school years in Eureka Springs, some of the other things that come to mind are swimming in Lake Crescent, which is now called Lake Eureka. It had a wide board walk all along the west side and a long building about middle ways which housed the attendance office and the change rooms. There were two diving towers, a toboggan slide, a bridge over the upper end, and a roped off kitty section with a water top and a water wheel and floodlights for night swimming. Up the hollow at the far end of Lake Crescent, not far above the Saucer Spring, there was a stone arch bridge exactly like the ones on the Lake Lucerne Road. There was no road leading to it on either end, just a bridge across the ravine in the middle of the woods. It was constructed as a streetcar bridge when plans were being made to extend the streetcar line out to Lake Lucerne when the lake was called the Sanitarium Lake and was to be the site of a large sanitarium. However, the plans never materialized, but the arch remained. The center part eventually caved in and the stones were scattered about the ravine. We used to go up there and play around the stones, but the last time was I was up that way, the remnant of the bridge was covered in vines and almost hidden from view. The original plans for the arched bridges are on display in the Eric Springs Historical Museum. Another thing that comes to mind was going fishing with my father. We would walk down the railroad tracks to the trestle over Leatherwood Creek in the vicinity of where Holiday Island is now located and fish with minnow hooks until we caught a dozen or so minnows. Nice slicks and creek chubs, not shiners such as those offered for sale today. A slick or a creek chub will stay alive on your hook all day if not taken by a bass or a crappie. From there, we would walk on over to beaver and fish on the rocks just below the narrows. Near the end of the day, we would walk back up the tracks to Eureka. It was fun walking the trestles, and my father was aware of the train schedule, so we were never in any danger. Each year, about the middle of June, we would start buying firecrackers, putting them in a box in the closet or under the bed, and try to get the box filled by the 4th of July. Walker Brothers Department Store had a basement which resembled a hardware store with dishes, utensils, electrical supplies, and so forth. And they always had the best supply of fireworks in town. Just as you entered Walker Brothers, where the present entry is, was the entrance to the stairway. It was a wide, I believe, oak stairway and was it was, a, it was a beautiful stairway. Another place that handled fireworks was Prendergrass Drug Store. When the fourth finally arrived, we shot off the firecrackers, which were called salutes, the torpedoes, the spit devils, the grasshoppers, and the snakes, a few at a time to make them last all day. And, of course, we took time off to help turn the handle of the ice cream freezer, and we always had a wash tub filled with chunks of ice and all flavors of soda pop sitting out in the yard under the elm tree. After dark, we would shoot off the Roman candles from the upstairs porch and end up with the sparklers and fountains in the front yard. During those years, I spent quite a lot of time reading. Mary Lena Barnes was librarian at the Carnegie Library for years and was always helpful to young people. Also, an elderly couple by the name of Reynolds purchased the house next to ours on the north side, and two walls of their living room was lined with books, including most of the Zane Gray books, the Tom Swift books, Horatio Alger books, and the Tarzan books. They let the neighborhood kids borrow books two at a time. The library always had some of the current books, and one of my favorites was We, which was written by Lindbergh after his famous flight. Several songs were written about his flight and came out in sheet music and recordings. We had two of the Lindbergh records and played them until we had memorized every word. Radios also became popular during that period, and the afternoon soaps became a part of life. During the summer months, I listened to some of them as my mother and sister were fans of this innovation and always had them on. 
Some of the soaps that I remember were Vic and Sade, Ma Perkins, Stella Dallas, One Man's Family, Backstage Wife, and so forth. There was no air conditioning, and everyone kept their windows open. And as you walked down most any street in town of an afternoon, you could hear the radios and keep up with the story. The grown-ups were not just sitting idly listening to the radio. They were sewing, tatting, quilting, embroidering, appliquing, and or canning vegetables and fruits, or maybe snapping beans and hulling peas. From time to time, there would be a fad such as making flowers out of crepe paper and dipping them in paraffin. One summer, everyone was making wind chimes from glass. Squares, rectangles, and triangles were cut from the glass, decorated with watercolors, and hung from a small hoop on strings. On a breezy day, the chimes could be heard all over the neighborhood, for there was one, one or two on nearly everyone's porch. And, of course, everyone had a garden in those days. Eureka Springs was not on a regular bus line, and in the 20s, Mr. Grover Roark realized the need and established the Roark Transportation Company, which eventually had buses running from Fayetteville through Eureka Springs to Little Rock. The company logo was a gold R on a circular background. The bus station was in the All Red Hotel, which is now the New Orleans, in the room now occupied by the French Market Cafe. Mr. Roark operated the line until the mid-30s when he sold it to Trailways, and it became a part of the National Trailway System. Lonnie Roark and I used to get our fishing tackle together and get a free ride on the morning southbound bus as far as Kings River fish all day and be backed up the highway in time to catch the afternoon northbound bus back home. I often wondered what the passengers thought when they saw two kids with fishing gear flagging down a bus. On several occasions we caught the bus as far as the road that now goes to the airport and from there we would walk down that road past the present airport site and on down to Osage River, wade across and up through a field and come out at the back of the home of Lonnie's grandmother, a Mrs. Roden where we would spend the weekend fishing, swimming, and eating. She lived in a small white cottage with a thick green lawn in front, and on the left side of the front gate just inside the yard was a tall poplar tree with white bark and quivering leaves. It would have made a perfect scene for a calendar. Mrs. Roden served more for breakfast than most people had for supper. Eggs and ham, hot biscuits and gravy, fresh milk, watermelon and tomato preserves, a variety of jams and all sorts of things. In the evening, we would sit on the grassy lawn under the poplar tree playing mumble peg. I always looked forward to visiting in that pastoral setting. In the fall of 35, three of us, Lee Hill Boyer and Virgil Sheppel from Berryville, Virgil was a star of the Bobcats football team over there, and myself, all Methodists who had become acquainted with each other through the county-wide youth activities of the church, loaded our things into Lee's Model T touring car and headed down Highway 23 toward the College of the Ozarks at Clarksville, which was a Presbyterian school. We all had scholarships of one kind or another, but not far down the road, a leak sprung in the radiator, and we had to stop about every 10 miles to get water from someone's well. Before we got to Ozark, something happened to the Bandito. On a Model T, that's the, something that makes it go. And we had to pull over to the side of the road by a barn and find a piece of bailing wire, which remedied the situation. We arrived at the campus about 5 o'clock after an all-day trip. Not long after I was there, I got a job for two periods a day working in the bookstore and the college post office, which was my introduction to the postal service. The next year, I transferred to the University of Arkansas over at Fayetteville, which was considerably closer to Eureka Springs, and I attended there for one year. During the summer of 36, I took my first full-time job working a 12-hour shift from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. at the Crescent Hotel as bellhop and night clerk. In those days, most of the guests stayed a week or longer, and I met some very fine people. Dr. Schleckman, president of SMU at Dallas, brought his wife up and took a room on the East Veranda for the summer. He was gone most of the time on speaking engagements and recruiting students for SMU, but usually came in on weekends. When he would come in, he spent part of his time fishing and liked to use grasshoppers for bait. I would get a jar out of the Crescent Kitchen, 
and go down on the hillside and fill it with grasshoppers for him. And if he caught any fish, the cook would prepare them. I sort of hinted to him that I would be interested in some sort of a scholarship, but got nowhere, even after catching all those grasshoppers. But the selectmans were wonderful people, and I can still see Mrs. Selectman sitting in a Boston rocker on the east veranda with her crocheting and reading. Another guest I remember was a, Ms. a Mrs. White from Tulsa, dark complected of Indian origin, who came over to spend six weeks and brought her piano with her so she could keep up with her practicing. However, she started playing the piano early of the morning and disturbing the other guests, and the manager had to ask her not to play until 10 o'clock. Mr. W.T. Patterson of Pea Ridge owned both the Crescent and the Basin Park hotels, and after his last visit to the Crescent while I was working there, rumors about the possible sale of the hotel to a hospital were making the rounds. Sure enough, it was acquired by a Norman Baker from Muscatine, Iowa, and converted into a hospital for cancer patients. The full story of Norman Baker and the Crescent is covered in the new book, The Grand Old Lady of the Ozarks, by Dr. Woolery. Having enjoyed the work at the Crescent, which gave me a little background, I did not go back to college but applied for a job at the Basin Park Hotel and was hired by Mr. Homer McLaughlin, the manager, for the same shift I had at the Crescent, 7 to 7, bell hopping and clerking. There was more activity downtown than up on the hill, and no time for napping after midnight. Both restaurants across the street stayed open all night, Frank's Cafe and Hardy's Good Eats. Frank's Cafe was operated by Frank Helms, and Hardy's Good Eats was operated by George Hardy. And the hotel lobby served as a bus stop for the 3.20 a.m. southbound bus. And it was surprising at the number of people who would enter the lobby about 3 o'clock in the morning with their luggage to catch that bus. Norman Baker had succeeded in getting trailways to route their buses around the top of the mountain on 62B with a stop at the Baker Hospital and then come on down through town for the Basin Park stop. Another thing that kept the night man on his toes was the installation of the control buttons for the city fire siren in the alcove behind the desk at the Basin Park. When a fire was reported, the hotel clerk would first sound the siren, and then call some of the key firemen from a list posted by the control on the special fire telephone mounted beside the buttons. In case of a bad fire, we would hold the on button longer before pushing the off button. The siren was mounted on the hillside at the lower end of Eureka Street where the old fire bell had stood, where it could be heard all over town, and it gave you an eerie feeling to hear it scream out in the night at the press of your finger. Norman Baker, his sister Irma, and various members of his staff would frequently have dinner at Hardy's Cafe across from the Basin Park. They would usually arrive about 8 o'clock in the evening in his lavender cord in another car and pull up in front of the cafe or hotel as parking was no problem then. Once inside, they would put several tables together, and they sometimes would bring along a musician with a guitar to play while they were eating. This caused quite a lot of conversation from the locals at first, but soon became commonplace. Mr. Baker would often come into the lobby and chat with the employees. On one occasion when he was in the lobby, the elevator had dropped down about two feet below the lobby floor and would not go back up. The people climbed out and the bellman tried to get us started back up with no success. Uh, it was a hand-operated elevator at that time. I started to call the maintenance man when Baker stepped over and said, let me take a look at that first. He climbed down in, asked for a screwdriver, and in a few minutes the elevator rose to the floor position. Some guests in the lobby cheered. He came over to the counter and took a piece of paper and drew a, di drew a diagram of the control, very professional drawing, showing what had caused the trouble. As he went out the door, he said, if you ever have any more mechanical trouble, just call Norman Baker. He was a striking figure with his wavy white hair, lavender shirt and tie, white linen suit with a lavender silk handkerchief in the breast pocket, and his lavender cord, which would fit perfectly with today's foreign models. He had a huge St. Bernard dog about the size of a Shetland pony, and if he had the dog in the car, it took up the whole back seat. In October, 
1937, the hotel received an inquiry regarding accommodations for the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, as Eureka Springs was on the itinerary of their scheduled trip to America. Everyone was excited about it. There had been so much publicity about the Duke marrying Wallace Warfield, an American, that summer. Although the reservations were not yet firm, the second floor was designated for the royal party, and the newly married couple would be assigned to suite 201 and 2, or the honeymoon suite 223, which had recently been redecorated with scenic wall cloth imported from France. Mrs. Celia B. Paul, who gave expression lessons at her home studio, was to instruct the hotel employees as to the proper conduct and the presence of royalty, how to curtsy and so forth, and all that English traditional stuff. And we went around bowing to each other, cursing to a chair and so forth, and had a lot of fun. On October the 21st, 1937, the Times Echo had banner headlines about the visit. They arrived in America, but for some reason their trip was cut short, and we never had the pleasure of hosting the former King Edward VIII who abdicated the throne of England to marry the woman he loved. Franklin Roosevelt had been inaugurated as president in 1933 and again in 1937, and the New Deal or NRA National Recovery Act was in full swing, and the WPA Works Progress Administration had come to Arkansas. There were several projects in Carroll County, and one of the largest was the construction of a dam across Leatherwood Creek, which would eventually form Lake Leatherwood. Salaries ranged from about $30 a month for unskilled labor and on a scale up to $64 a month for professional. Many persons, including businessmen from Eureka Springs, were hired for the various positions. Mickey Camel, who had held the number three chair at the Basin Park Barbershop for years, quit his job and went out to the dam and was hired as a timekeeper. Elmer Pickens, a bank examiner, was given a position in the Spring Street office as an accountant. I applied for a position with the State Mineral Survey, another WPA project sponsored by the U.S. Geologic Survey, but received a notice to report to one of the offices of the Leatherwood Project, which was located just below the dam site. About that time, the warehouse, a long building which was located near the east side of the dam, caught fire and completely burned, and I was given the job of going through all of the back invoices check-out slips and check-in slips and so forth to determine what was in the warehouse when it burned and typing a detailed list of the items and their cost. About the time I got it finished, my transfer to the County Mineral Survey project came through. And a month later, in October of 39, the county supervisor was transferred to another county and I was assigned to fill the vacancy with a wage classification of professional and technical at a salary of $55.90 a month plus $25 travel expense. The purpose of the project was to collect at least four samples of water from the wells and springs in each square mile of Carroll County, send them to the lab in Little Rock, and measure the full depth of the water in the wells along with the depth from ground level to the surface of the water. I always thought that I got the job as my application showed that I had taken a survey course in geology at the College of the Ozarks and a year of geology and lab at the University of Arkansas. Several of the geology students that I knew at the university were working in the state office of the survey in Little Rock. I remained until the survey was completed in 1940. The next two years found me back at the Basin Park Hotel where I accepted the position of assistant manager the week after we had closed out the mineral survey office. Lloyd Patterson, the son of the owner, was manager, but he had other interests and was out of town a good part of the time. The Western Union was now a part of the front desk operation. I had to take a week's course to learn uh, to operate the teletype machine and so forth. The second year, uh, Mr. Patterson took an extended leave for the entire year, and I assumed the title of acting manager, a position which I held until my enlistment in the Army Air Force in 1942. There was a busload of about 20 persons from the Eureka Springs area who had either enlisted or had been drafted, who traveled together to the reception center at Little Rock. While we were on the way down there, the reception center caught fire and many of the records burned which delayed things for several days. 
The recruiting official had told those of us who enlisted in the Air Force that we would stay together, but we were scattered all over Texas and Kansas. I spent my first year and a half as an aircraft dispatcher at Strother Field, Winfield, Kansas, a branch of the Central Flying Training Command. It was a uh, flying training school where cadets who had completed their primary training spent two months. At switch time, they soloed in a BT-13, did acrobatics, landing stages, cross country, and night flying, plus a few hours in the link trainers on the ground. Those cadets who completed the course satisfactorily went on to another school for their advanced training, either in single engine or multi-engine aircraft, and from there received their commissions and were on their way to an assignment in the war zone. Most of the training schools closed after about a year and a half as there were enough pilots for that time. For the next year and a half, I was in the Special Services Department at Fort Worth Army Air Base, which had been designated as a rest area for personnel returning from the war zones of Africa and Italy. Our department operated a library, post theater, swimming pool, band shell, service club, hobby shop, miniature golf course, and a dock on Lake Worth with boats and fishing equipment. All of these things were free except the post theater where the admission was 15 cents and the latest films were shown. It was a pleasant spot for those returning from the war zone to rest up. The people, the locals rather, in Fort Worth referred to it as Fort Worth Country Club. Although the war was over on both fronts by September of 45, I remained at the Fort Worth base until December, was transferred to Grenier Field, Manchester, New Hampshire, where I received orientation for survival in frigid weather zone, was issued fur-lined items of clothing, and was all set to go to one of the Air Transport Command bases in Greenland when a reduction in force order came through and I was scheduled to be discharged in February. So back to Arkansas, very disappointed that I had never left the United States, especially at a time when I could have had free travel. And I especially wanted to go to Greenland and swim in those natural hot water pools up there. Eureka Springs was a different town than the one I left in 42. The Basin Park Hotel had changed hands and had a full staff, as well as many of the business houses. There was a migration of people from up north, especially from around the Chicago area. Shortly after my return, I was contacted by Mr. Lee Morgan, president of the Chamber of Commerce, advising that the chamber was without an office manager. The directors had been taking turns in the office and wondered if I would take over at least for the summer season, unless I had other plans. I accepted on a temporary basis, and it gave me a chance to meet many of the new people who were beginning to be a part of Eureka Springs life. I became acquainted with Mr. Neil Walters, one of the directors who was president of the Neil Walters Poster Corporation, a printing firm specializing in outdoor advertising. Mr. Walters and his family, consisting of his wife, three sons, and six daughters, had moved from Kansas City, where he had operated the U.S. Printing and Engraving Company before the war. He was looking for someone for his front office. I took the job at the end of the tourist season, and I believe a Mr. Bob Service took the chamber position. Bob was another newcomer. He had spent some time in the office and had visions of organizing a folk festival, and his dreams were realized when his hard work and efforts resulted in the first annual Ozark Folk Festival in 1948, and has continued every year since that time. The Walters Poster Corporation was located in the building at 11 North Main, formerly the Berryville Wholesale, and the building next to it. A huge press was located on the ground floor for printing paper for billboards. It takes 24 large sheets to cover a standard size billboard, and they have to be folded in a certain manner so that the paper hangers will get them on the billboard straight. A small press called the Pony was used for several sizes of posters and window cards. The shipping department was also on that floor, and the shipments were taken by truck to Garfield, Arkansas for connection with the railroad. The bindery and stockroom was upstairs. 
In the building next door, there were two job presses, a huge paper cutter, more stock, the manager's office, and the front office, which now included the Western Union. That was a handy arrangement, as many of our orders were received by telegram, particularly those requests for billboard paper for coming attractions such as circus, carnivals, rodeos, and county fairs all over the United States. I remained with the corporation for almost five years, during which time one of Mr. Walter's daughters, Lola, and I were married. The corporation expanded their operation to include the printing of snap-out business forms and occupied two more buildings in that block. The new branch was called General Business Forms. They later outgrew their quarters and moved to Bentonville, Arkansas in 1964. In 1950, the Times Echo carried a notice regarding a civil service examination which would be given to select a postmaster for the Eureka Springs office to replace Harvey Fuller, Claude Fuller's brother who had been postmaster for years until his recent death. My wife and I talked about it and decided that I should take the examination. Any visions I had of becoming postmaster flew out the window when I saw the room full of persons taking the test that morning, including many prominent Eureka Springs businessmen. However, my grade was one of the top three, and in those days, the names of the top three were submitted to the congressman from that district, Jim Trimble, and he made a recommendation to the Senate with the approval of the two senators from the state, Fulbright and McClellan. After confirmation by the Senate, a presidential commission was issued. My commission arrived, signed by Harry Truman, and I was installed on February 1, 1951 as postmaster. Bob Hudson, who had been a postal employee for many years, was assistant postmaster and was very helpful in getting me oriented into this new world of government procedures. He told me he had no desire to take the exam as he was secure in his position and had only a few years before mandatory retirement at the age of 70. In fact, no employees of the post office took the exam, for even though postmasters were now under civil service, the position was still considered more or less dependent on the incumbent administration. A few weeks later, I received a call from Congressman Trimble asking how things were going, and I have never forgotten the way he ended the conversation. He said, well, Cecil, if you'll just get your cow and some chickens now, you'll just about have it made. During my 22 years in the Postal Service, many changes were made, but the thing that stands out in my mind was the remodeling of the Post Office building in 1971. The original elevator, powered by water pressure, was still in use but was rapidly failing. In fact, we loaded it up one morning with Sears and Roebuck catalogs, and it wouldn't budge. The driveway at the rear was narrow and the loading and unloading area was too small which had resulted in several accidents. The incoming mail trucks had to back in from Spring Street and tied up traffic on many occasions. The lighting was not good. The original coal furnace had been converted to gas and the original steam radiators were causing problems. We requested a new elevator, new lighting and heating, and enlargement of the rear maneuvering area. A survey was made which included a study of the movement of mails in and out of the post office, measurement of the volume of mail, and a projection of the future growth of the community for the next 20 years. This was done in cooperation with the city officials. After several more months of correspondence and inspections, by officials from the regional office in St. Louis and General Service Administration in Dallas and Fort Worth, we received a set of blueprints which included everything we had requested plus air conditioning and enlargement of the building. And the plans for the rear maneuvering area included space for employee parking. We had all parked across the street on the lot owned by the Assembly of God Church, now owned by Epley. And although they did not charge us, we all contributed to their fund for repairing the stone walls and the uh, black topping of the lot. It was decided that we should move the postal operation to another building while the work was in progress. And we rented a building at 9 North Main owned by Greenlee and Epley, the one occupied by Acord's Interiors before he moved out to 23. And we added a steel door to the rear, flagpole in front, indoor-outdoor carpeting on the complete floor space, 
a base for the lock boxes, fluorescent lights, and anything else that we thought we might need for the operation of the post office. Several counter sections and lobby desks were loaned by the department for use during the renovation. The original plans called for the removal of one of the ginkgo trees, and I knew that if that happened, I'd probably have to leave town. As Bob Hudson had told me that the trees had been brought from Japan by Major Penn as a gift to the city. The department was cooperative in making several changes in the original plans when they learned that we were interested in the preservation movement, which had begun. The blueprints for the driveway were changed to save both trees, although a huge limb from one of the trees had to be removed. The original plans also called for the removal of the paneling in the lobby and the removal of the writing desks or shelves, the ones with the iron brackets and the plate glass tops with beveled edges, and replacement of those with little new desks such as you see in the new post office. Our objection to that resulted in a visit by an official from the Dallas office, and the plans were changed. We kept most of the original lobby. The bricks in the new addition were laid in the same manner as in the old part, including the arches inset above the windows and the wooden trim along the top. The engineer told us that within a few years of weathering, the new bricks would blend in with the old bricks and it would be hard to tell where the new part started. Actually, the plans call for just about a doubling of the size of the building. A date was set for the beginning of the actual work to start and there was to be a final meeting of the contractors and subcontractors and regional officers of the Post Office and General Services Administration. We set up a table in the basement with four chairs on each side for the contractors and four on the other side for the Post Office officials with pads, pencils, coffee urn, and so forth. At the scheduled time, the contractors were there, but on the other side of the table, no one from St. Louis or Dallas showed up, and I was the only one representing the department. In the course of the meeting, I nervously signed a number of documents, regardless of what title was under the blank signature space. And my signature gave the go-ahead for a half-million-dollar project. Needless to say, I didn't sleep very well that night. Before the day was over, the rear vestibule had been removed and part of the back side of the building, and the front lawns were covered with supplies and equipment. The Main Street building was not quite ready, and even though the work was in progress, we operated in the regular post office building for several days, and the mail was loaded in and out of the front lobby windows. We moved the post office on March 4, 1971, at 9 a.m. after the carriers had departed to serve their routes with instructions to return to the new location. One window clerk was on duty in the new location before we started moving so there would be no interruption of service except for the 22 minutes in which there was no post office box service while the box section was being moved. The only complaint we received with reference to the move was from the president of a garden club who thought one of the ginkgo trees would be removed. I assured her that both ginkgo trees would be there when the project was completed as well as all the shrubbery that had been set out during Lady Bird Johnson's beautification program. Under the terms of the contract, the contractor w was required to remove from the premises everything that would not be used in the renovation. The wheelers bought the huge back doors for their building next door. The Rick Springs Methodist Church bought one of the iron circular stairways, which is still in the church, and the other stairway was sold to the owner of a chalet in North Carolina. The ceiling fans and some of the light fixtures were sold to some of the downtown stores. While we were operating on Main Street, the old post office department went out of existence and the new corporation took over on July the 1st, 1971, which was called Postal Service Day. When the project was completed and all inspections made, we moved back on September the 23rd, 1971, and I enjoyed the new quarters for a year before my retirement, with 22 years postal and three military, making the required 25 years. I figured that was long enough, for I was beginning to get that old civil service shuffle when I walked. I guess it is normal for a person who retires to have a list of things in his mind to do with all that leisure time that he will have. Well, 
In my case, I had everything done that I'd planned on in less than a year. Of course, I received quite a number of calls asking me to be chairman of this, secretary of that, a member of such and such a committee, and so forth. But I felt that I had done my share of those things for a while. I had found out shortly after my entry into the Postal Service that a postmaster was expected to take on such extracurricular activities as heading charitable drives, taking a prominent part in activities such as Chamber of Commerce, Rotary Club, and serving on various commissions and so forth. At the time of my retirement, I was still serving on a three-year term as a director of the Chamber of Commerce and held the position of treasurer. In the spring of 1973, I decided to call on the new people from Wichita who had purchased the Crescent Hotel and sign them up for a membership in the Chamber. In the course of my conversation with Michael Dander and the new manager, I found that their staff was not complete. So I filled out an application for employment with the firm, which was called Crescent Heights Developments. And by the time the hotel opened on May the 1st, I was again on the staff of the Crescent after an absence of 35 years. I thought it would be interesting going back after all those years, and it was. It was altogether a different world that I found myself in, completely different from the downtown scene. The Crescent really was like the slogan, a castle in the air high atop the Ozarks. I started out on my old shift that I had in the 30s, except that it had been cut down to only 8 hours, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. After a few weeks, when the staff was finalized, I found myself as accommodations manager or sometimes call front desk manager. When the package tours became popular, I became group coordinator. And when the firm of Riverview Management took over, my assignment was director of sales. After 11 years, I retired again, this time due to health problems. Many things which we take for granted and are a normal part of present day life were first introduced to Eureka Springs during my lifetime. Some of these firsts are aerosol shaving cream, for instance. Ross Graham, manager of the Basin Park Barbershop, used it first in the barbershop. That was when men were still getting shaves in barbershops. The word spread around about the lather coming out of a can instead of being whipped up in a mug with soap and brush, or coming from a tube like toothpaste. And for several days, men would gather around the front window of the shop, and he would bring the can over to the window to dispense the foam where all could see it before applying it to a customer's face. Ross still lives here, and when I called him, he remembered all about it, but couldn't remember the date. In the early 50s, Glades Plumbing and Electric Shop received for demonstration purposes what was known as a radar range, which was a forerunner of the microwave oven. Mary Alice Miller gave the demonstration by cooking some cupcakes, which were distributed to the crowd. It was hard to believe that anything could cook so quickly. One of the first brand-named radios on Spring Street was acquired by the Roark family. It was a FEDA, battery-operated, with quite a number of dials and controls and a separate speaker and battery. As far as I can remember, the first radio on East Mountain was owned by Jim Black, my brother-in-law. It was an Atwater Kent, had three tuning dials which had to be lined up to bring in a station and a rheostat control. It sat on a library table with a cone top cone-type speaker on top and a battery on the shelf beneath. It was connected to both a ground wire and an aerial or an antenna, which was a copper wire stretched between two trees with insulators on each end. On Saturday evening, the living room would be full of neighbors to hear the Grand Ole Opry from station WSM Nashville if it could be brought in clearly. The first automobile on East Mountain that I remember was an early model Ford owned by Mr. Clyde Hall, who operated a tin shop here for many, many years and was known as Mr. Fixit. He drove the same car for years and years. Natural gas came to Eureka Springs and was turned on for the first time on April 30th, 1948. The Arkansas Western Gas Company brought the line to the city and Mr. James Perkins, who still lives here, was the town plant manager. Gas was manufactured in the early days but was used primarily for lighting and was finally replaced by electricity. Well, I guess that's about it.
The things that I've mentioned here happened over the past 60 some odd years and are only those that I have been a part of or at least observed. Of course, they are mostly from memory or from notes that I've scribbled out occasionally down through the years. I began saving things when I was in the first grade. However, someone else who grew up here at the same time may have altogether a different concept of what it was like to grow up here in Eureka Springs and spend most of their life here. This is Cecil Walker, and today is September the 13th, 1986.